everybody. Oh my God, look at you all. The first thing I'm gonna get everyone to do is pop your coffees down and stand up for me. Usually I have a lot more room, so I'll be succinct. Ah, so cool. Cool, all right. So what I'm gonna get everyone to do, can I please get you to put your heels together and your toes apart in a little V shape? It's a little yoga locking pose. And what I'm gonna get us to do, because we're here nice and early in the morning, I'm gonna get us all to do a little bit of a stretch. So can I get everyone to just raise their arms all the way up? Oh, that's so cool to see everyone do it. And just rotate your wrists around. Oh, super cool. Take a few deep breaths, rotate them the other way. Yes. <laughs> this is so cool. All right, take your seats again. It always feels good to start a little bit more relaxed at the beginning of workshops and talks. It's really good to bring everyone onto the same level and make sure that everyone feels as silly as I do. Um, so thank you all for taking part in that. Hello everyone, I'm Ryan. I use he, him pronouns and I work here at Portable. Um, we do some really cool stuff. But first, can I just get a gauge of who's in the room with me today? Can I get a hand up if there's a designer in the room or designers in the room? There's a few. Can I get a hand up for the researchers in the room? There's a few. Can I get a hand up for the practitioners in the room? Any mental health, mental health practitioners? There's a few. Any students? Hey, hello, students. How are you? I'm a student too. Uh, cool. Well, that's a nice little um, sort of gauge of everyone in the room, which is awesome. I hope that everyone is able to take away what I'm able to share with you today and implement it in the practice that you do, regardless of whatever that practice is. And welcome to Portable. As Joe talked about, we're a design and innovation tech, you name it, kind of company. We work on a whole bunch of different um, areas and a different um, topics. Uh, and we're really fun to work with. This is a really cool space. And thank you all for sharing it with us today. At Portable, I wear a few hats. Uh, I like to call myself a bit of a helping hand because it's what I genuinely really like to do. Um, as a role, I'm a service designer. So I work um, along the research and design areas. Um, I'm a mental health first aider accredited, um, which is really fun and allows me to be a bit more aware about the mental health um, with the people that we work with. Um, I have my own lived experience of poor mental health in the past, and I use that to give me strength, and I'll hopefully be able to share a bit uh, with you today. Oh, I'm so nervous, my goodness. Um, <laughs> I really enjoy helping people. Um, gives me a lot of pleasure and a lot of strength. Uh, and I'm a big, big, big proponent of learning lessons. One of my motto, uh, mottos is make mistakes once, and I can tell you that I've made a shit ton of mistakes. Mainly though, at, at Portable, we work for purpose. It's a big driver of what we do, and we really seek it out in everything that we do, making sure that we're working uh, with a drive that enables us to ha have strength and provide a great service and bring out the best in the people that we work with, because we do work with some really sensitive and complex uh, social issues. Doing that can be challenging. It can take a toll on you. Um, and we have a rigorous sort of a theory and practice that we follow in order to give ourselves the structure to do so. We use uh, service design as a practice, uh, going using different research methods um, all the way through design. Primarily what I'll be talking about today is around workshops and co-design. Uh, and design thinking is the background of what we do. We're big proponents of the IDEO for any um, designers in the room. They're the uh, sort of forefathers of human-centered design, and they put it on the radar. It makes sure that the human is at the center of everything that we do, and it makes sure that uh, whatever design we do, whatever research we do, it is centered around them, and makes sure that the, they come up with the solutions as well. <coughs> really, really powerful tool, and great for taking to stakeholders, when you can say, you might think this, but your end users think this, and they're the ones who are going to benefit from whatever you do. Service design is often used in larger corporations like banks and, and well, government as well, but um, particularly in larger organizations uh, where a customer is at the end of the activities that we do. A lot of the time it's to find better and more efficient services so that you can get more money out of them um, or create a better experience for that end user, which is great, but it's also great for other complex problems. Being able to utilize a toolkit that puts the human at the center of what we do is fantastic for complex issues like mental health, like justice and education, where the end user is sort of the future and is someone who can really benefit from having themselves put at the center of everything that we do. Please ask questions along the way as well. I'm talking really, really fast. I'm really nervous, but thank you all very much. Some of the areas that we work with, we have these three kind of pillars at Portable that we work with. Sorry for the people over there who might not be able to see the screen, but uh, they are health, justice and education. All of these have uh, vulnerable people or young people at the centre of them. 
Um, we work across mental health organisations like Origin and Headspace. I have our sister organisation Origin in the room, which is fantastic because a lot of my learnings have come from working alongside them. Um, we work with uh, queer organisations as well, like Minus 18 and The Shed, which is a um, trans male organisation here in Collingwood. We work across health in breast cancer, so talking to people who have lived experience of uh, all sorts of medical conditions um, and poor mental health and things like that. Uh, we work across injustice through family violence, which is a very another fraught topic. So you can be talking with people who have been through this and you want to be able to make sure that they're able to offer you as much as they possibly can so that you can create beneficial solutions for them. And through to education, where you might, young people uh, through the education system, obviously they do encounter mental health at a higher rate than the general populace, but it's also just making sure that you can talk to young people in a way that will work for them and will be able to um, draw out the most of them. For Dairy Australia, it seems like a bit of an outlier, but uh, we worked on a uh, program to bring education into primary schools um, so that farm safety education could be brought out um, and taught to their parents as well. So it was kind of making sure that we could work with little tiny people uh, who I don't have great experience with and making sure we could do that well. There were so many different facts about mental health that I could have thrown in, but this was the biggest one. One in five of us will deal with mental health by the time we're 20, uh, poor mental health by the time we're 25 and one, of, uh, one in five of 16 to 85 year olds deal with a uh, mental health issue, uh, be it depression, anxiety, or substance abuse is the top three. That's a lot of people, and it means that any time you encounter a, a complex problem that you have more than five people that you're dealing with, one of them is likely to um, have mental health as a issue that you need to address, and so it's a really core part of what we need to focus on. You can imagine blowing that up to about 25 people in a workshop, and add the layers of poor mental health, um, mental health organisations, family violence or education, and suddenly you've got a lot of people who you need to be making sure you're able to create a safe space for and bring out the best solutions from. The main areas that we do this in um, are the research and design areas through co-design and workshops, which as I say is what I'm going to be focusing on today, making sure that you're able to create those environments where people can have uh, can impart their knowledge in a safe way and be able to create solutions for themselves um, that will work. Uh, it can, those can be uh, long processes and they can involve multiple workshops, so there are a lot of learnings you can have along the way. Um, and yeah, it extends further into different types of research like user interviews, um, contextual surveys and things like that where you need to make sure that your language is on point and you're able to address things uh, with these people in a way that uh, they will respond to. I'm repeating myself, funnily enough. So I'm going to be going through three main things today. Some of the experiences that we've had so far in the workshops that we've run. Some of the risks and hazards that we've identified coming out of them, pardon me. That hopefully you can have in your mind as you move forward into the, um, what you might be doing next. And some tips and tricks as well that hopefully you'll be able to take forward and implement today and beyond uh, to help create uh, safe workspaces for yourself, for your participants and for your colleagues as well, which is a really big part of it. Next. Cool. So I'll jump into our experiences. I'm doing really well on time. The first one is language matters. This is a really big one. Um, it's making sure that you're able to address people in the way that will make them feel good and feel safe. You might have all sorts of different intersections of people who have their own backgrounds. Everyone has their own background and you need to be aware of that. Um, it could be someone who's from a queer space, it could be someone who's had a lived experience of violence, it could be someone who's had a lived experience of a traumatic medical experience. Um, it could be a young person who's being bullied at school. All of those people have um, all sorts of different backgrounds and making sure that you're able to do the research and think about it beforehand so that you can walk in and talk to those people effectively is really great. Can anyone tell me what a cutie pock is? Any hands? Bam. Uh, really tight Indeed. What a cute name for such a tight intersection um, of the queer space. Queer, trans or intersex person of colour. It's a really you know, a divisive time in terms of gender and sexuality at this point. Thank goodness we have gender equality um, in marriage, which is fantastic. But a lot of people are still uh, on the road to equality and finding themselves a space in society. So these people are people that you need to make sure that you're able to address in the nature that they are, um, be able to seek consent to use your own language. Uh, in this, in a particular workshop with these, uh, these guys, I use the colloquial guys uh, for a group of people. 
and uh, got some funny looks because they weren't necessarily guys. Um, and so uh, in that, being able to say to them, look, this is what I use, is that okay? Luckily that group, they were okay with that. But sometimes you might need to change your language to make sure um, you're addressing them. A really good one is using folks, is a, is a common term for queer um, and trans people. And same with um, victim survivors of family violence. These people might have a uh, really extensive and harrowing background. And so making sure that you're able to address them and use language that will work for them and their experiences is really, really important. Using softer language. Hello there. OK, sure. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And there's even that. Exactly. And I'll talk very quickly about triggers a little bit later as well, because they can be very unexpected. And thank you so much for pointing that out. Another um, one to do for any designers in the room, or service designers in particular. Has anyone here used the Crazy Eights as an activity? It's a really good activity that forces, um, during uh, co-design, people to think uh, in rapid ideation. So it's an activity where you take an A3 piece of paper, you fold it in half three times and unfold it, and you get eight different squares. Then you get eight minutes, one minute per square, where you have to uh, draw or write or articulate uh, a solution to a problem that you may be presented with. Really, really great, because after the first three or four, you've exhausted all of your common sense ideas, and it forces you to think outside of the box. Often UFOs make an appearance, because we use those as a, as a um, talking point. So it might be that uh, in the case of dairy, how can we make sure that um, someone doesn't get run over by a tractor? Let's get a UFO to take that tractor away. And how could that, yeah, exactly. How could that idea be used to actually um, implement, maybe there's a drone safety system. And so you can start drawing those ideas out. We do rounds of these, which is fantastic. And you can see the little dots on each of these, where as a group, you come up and you talk about each of those ideas. And, uh, and hotspot them to find the ones, the ideas that have affinity between everyone, and through that, the sort of top ideas start filtering. However, crazy is not the best word to be using when you're dealing with um, people with mental health, and so we're uh, trying to find a different name for it at the moment that is beyond rapid ideation in eight minute intervals. Any suggestions? Welcome. Magic aids, there you go. Second experience is around protocols, making sure that everybody is briefed into what you're walking into. In workshops, you're going to have yourself, you're going to have your participants, you're going to have your colleagues, and you might even have, in the cases of mental health, uh, practitioners or psychologists on hand to help you out. Making sure that everyone understands what to do if something does go wrong is really, really important, and something that we've learned along the way, where we walked into a workshop that we felt we were safe in, we felt that we were briefed, and then someone was uh, triggered in a way that we didn't expect. And uh, they ended up taking out one of our facilitators as well, who attached themselves to that um, experience of that young person. And so suddenly, we had to go into a space where uh, there's now one less of us. There's been this event. Everybody's aware of it. And you need to be able to fall in and have a chain of command to follow. Um, so that's a big learning for us and something that we now do. It, yeah, it's not just about briefing the participants on what's going to be happening. It's about briefing each other and making sure that everyone's on the same page. Everyone understands who each other are and our own backgrounds as colleagues so that we can understand what happens uh, if something does go awry. Third one is allowing time. This comes from, and I'll talk a lot about the experiences that we've had because we have made some of these mistakes and we have learned from them. Yes, is, a, is allowing time making sure that you have enough time for warm-ups, for introductions, as I t totally skipped this morning. Uh, and uh, and cool-downs is really, really big, and making sure that everyone understands by providing enough warning um, to everyone who might be involved, so that everyone has an idea of what they're going to be doing. Uh, this comes from a workshop that we ran where uh, we made an assumption, and you should make assumptions, of course, um, that uh, the people, the young people that we had were, uh, would know each other, and so they would have more of a collegiate basis, and we could probably skip some of the niceties in the sort of getting to know you activities. Turns out they'd had a really, really busy weekend of a whole bunch of other stuff, and they came in quite tired. Hello there. Oh. Sure. Um, yeah, they, they came in um, quite tired, and so our assumption that, that they would have a comfort level, and we were able to condense what we were doing and try and squeeze a bit more into that workshop was actually uh, not right. So now we have uh, some core ideas, which I'll go to in just a second, um, about how to alleviate that.
Uh, we have developed, I mean, for, for research activities, um, particularly the ones that we're doing alongside Origin, we seek out wellness plans from our young people. So we are briefed as well beforehand in how to address them um, in a constructive way. Uh, but we also have a couple of other tactics that I'll go into in making sure that everybody, uh, when we do come in and we do we do, do introductions, that everybody sits on the same um, level and everyone understands what goes into making a safe and creative space um, for everybody involved. In allowing time though, these are our three kind of core things that we've identified. Making sure that workshops that you run um, that might touch on a complex issue, be it education, something in justice um, or health and, and mental health, is at least four hours in length. For any designers in the room, this might go without saying, but it's something that is really, really important, which makes sure that you have enough time for doing those introductions, for doing those cool rounds, for having debriefs, and making sure that even in one four hour period, you might only conduct one one hour long activity so that everybody can have the time to feel themselves and feel good about what they're doing. Making sure that the agendas go out for that workshop around at least two weeks in advance. We try and hold ourselves to this, but sometimes even we don't. Um, make sure that, that can, the agendas can go out to the participants. They can go out to those other organisations that might be participating and everybody's clued in on what's going to be expected. It's a really big part of the briefing process for participants, um, making sure that they understand what they're going to be going through. Uh, and including that 45 minutes for introductions. That's a really, really big one and um, is, the, is the level that we've settled at, which does give time for, you know, you might have five or six different facilitators that need to introduce themselves to the young people. You might be doing um, different warm-up exercises like a yoga exercise, um, and we have a couple of others. Uh, you might be introducing other organisations. Uh, we've held a couple of workshops at uh, Facebook, which has been really good for a project. And so being able to bring Facebook in and talk about what they're doing in um, the mental health space was really good. And so it gives everyone just that breathing time to settle in, um, maybe have a bite to eat if it's around lunchtime um, and get into it. So I'll talk about any questions on those learnings at all at this point. Thanks. So we'll get into some of the risks and hazards that we've identified. These are things that have come up that we didn't predict as we were going through and we've learned from but are really crystalline examples of what you can do um, to alleviate some of these in the, in the future for yourselves. Persona attachment being a big one of these. This was not something that we expected and uh, was a surprise. Personas for any designers or researchers, hopefully anyone in the room who's encountered a persona before, knows that they're a really fantastic tool in research and design. They allow you to typify a user from whatever research you've been doing and make sure that whatever uh, design solutions, the way that you articulate about that user is crystallised really well. They can often be very, very full on. So you might have a lot of information about their background, about their goals, their age, their name. You might have a quote that's come out of some of the interviews you've conducted. They're really, really constructive and fantastic to do. But sometimes they can almost be too much. We had an experience, uh, the actual, what set off in that workshop, um, the young person was that we were bringing uh, personas into the workshop that talked about uh, people with lived experience of suicide. So we had, I think his name was Tommy, and he was 16 and he was being bullied and he was having a really tough time and he'd taken his own life. And that was, or he was close to taking his own life. And that was the persona, a very high risk person, which is great when you want to talk about these people to external um, stakeholders and be able to articulate it in reports. But when you're talking to someone who might associate with that, that can actually be really fraught. So what happened was that uh, a person in the, uh, in the workshop said, oh shit, I had a friend named Tommy and this is their one year anniversary of taking their life. And so it was a very, very sudden and dramatic turn that, um, that was taken. Uh, and it's where we learned a lot about the protocols through that experience. Uh, and what we took away from that is that when you're working with these uh, particular issues, creating detached personas is a really big part of it. Moving from a picture to a stick figure removing gender, removing names, removing overly specific uh, examples of their lives is, uh, worked really, really well from this point onwards. We ended up having three personas coming out of this project for different levels of um, risk uh, of those young people and what they needed. And so working with this uh, is now a lot more effective and we can feel confident about printing these out, putting them up on the walls and having young people read them without overly identifying that and mitigate that risk. Unexpected triggers is another one. Obviously, it could be anything. It could be whatever language you choose to use. Sometimes then, um, you can't account for everybody who uh, is in the room. Uh, and this is a 
interesting little example that came up in a workshop a little um, a few weeks ago, where we had a person come in. We knew that they had a um, eating disorder, and so we made sure in our workshop um, deck that we removed the word lunch and we put break in. Really nice little example of how to change your language and address someone's um, mental health or particular circumstance. Pardon me. Um, and they had their own safe word. But in this workshop, we went around, and I'll talk about room rules in a moment, but we went around and we said, okay, how can we make this workshop a safe space for everybody? Oh, cool, we'll use a safe word so that if anyone wants to leave at any point because they're feeling, um, for whatever reason, distraught, they certainly can. Nobody asks a question. There's a private space. They can chill out. That safe word was popcorn. So something that for the majority would have worked really effectively suddenly um, became a, pot a potential issue because it might have, the use of that might have triggered the person with a different um, mental health issue. So you can never be fully sure of what you're doing and so it's really important to just be uh, as aware as possible about who's in the room, what those triggers might be and be able to pivot effectively. Luckily in that one we had um, our, just our psychologist researchers and psychologists in the room to be able to work with that um, and it was addressed really well because we had a chain of command and protocols to put in place. And looking out for your fellow facilitators, um, that experience of having one of our facilitators who further identified on that young person's experience of losing their friend the year before, this kind of waterfall effect that happened, was a really stark example of something that we hadn't expected. We had thought we had briefed effectively walking into that situation. And, uh, after that point, we were like, okay, well, we need to do more. So now we sit down beforehand for a good half an hour, 45 minutes. We talk about what we're gonna be going into. We make sure that we understand that there might be triggers within us and uh, what we might be able to anticipate so that we can make sure that uh, we're able to look out for each other as well as our participants. It's a really big part of it and was what's something that um, pushed me to do the mental health first aid course that I did and anyone should do it if you can. Um, which allows us to be more aware of uh, the people around us and how to effectively triage those people depending on what their experience might be. Open space visibility, this is a really big one as well. Again, something that we didn't really see coming even though we felt that we had prepared effectively. We actually held a workshop um, in this space, um, less people, uh, but we had three different tables set up. We had two out here and we had one in the room behind us. These two, really great. Out here, all the participants able to see each other, able to communicate effectively. The facilitators were able to make eye contact with each other and the psychologists in the room, which was really great and went into that whole protocol idea of being able to triage people. However, we had one group behind here, which is great. We've got full whiteboards in there. It's fantastic. You can draw to your heart's content. Uh, but in that, um, at one point, one of the psychologists stepped out of the room and uh, there was someone, someone attached to something and uh, suddenly, there was an, uh, pardon me. suddenly there was a point at which the facilitator was left alone in a room without being able to make eye contact, eye contact and communicate with the other people around them in order to um, do that triage. So that was and eventually like it, what it was worked out, which was really good. But just that immediacy of, oh dear, something's not quite right and I'm unable to communicate that to the people around me and my support people uh, was, a, was a really big learning as well. So I want to leave you with some things that you can hopefully take away with you today and implement in whatever workshops that you're going to be running next. Firstly, creating those safe workshop environments is a really big part of it, making sure that you do take the time to understand who the people are that are going to be in the room and be able to address them effectively, be able to work out um, between each other how you're going to be able to do that. A couple of really cool things to do, as some of you might have done, you've got your name tags that you might have put down your pronouns with. Anytime you're working with a queer audience, this is a really fantastic thing to do. It gives people agency over how they would like to be addressed. For those cutie pop people and for the trans people we had in the room that day, it was a really fantastic thing to understand it at a glance that someone might prefer to have a um, she, her, or a they, them pronoun that otherwise might not have um, been obvious. And room rules. This is a fantastic one. It might go by a few different names and has been introduced by Tina, who's in the crowd today. Really, really great thing during that introduction, sit down with your participants and say, what is it that will help us create a safe space for you today? What, what is it that will help you feel creative and feel safe to express yourselves in a constructive way? It might be the right to ask questions. Everything stays in the room, so there's a confidentiality. Uh, everybody has an equal voice is a really big one and everyone has an opportunity to speak and to listen. 
and then bringing up all of your participants to sign that puts everybody on the same page and everybody understands. This activity only takes 10 minutes, but is probably one of the biggest, pardon me, biggest things that you can do at the beginning of a workshop to make sure that everybody is on that same page and everybody understands what will go in and be respectful to everybody else. Preparing for that effective facilitation, making sure that you understand what's going to be going into the workshop you're going to run as facilitators and how um, the activities that you can run within that to make sure that everyone's feeling good. We have a few little ones that we can do. The yoga warm-ups are a fantastic thing to do. As I say, it puts everybody on the same level, makes everyone understand that we're here to feel silly and we're here to feel creative and we're here to, to, to chill out a little bit and talk about um, potentially our lived experiences or the lived experiences of people around us. Um, usually when I have a lot more room, because there's so many of you today, um, we put our arms up, we do large breathing exercises. Another one that we have is called fall in, where you all stand in a circle. And the idea is that you slowly take a step forward. And then when, uh, after a few rounds, everybody's able to synchronize on that. And it's a really fun and effective way of going about things. At the end of workshops, being able to chill out and have a debrief, we usually have a group discussion um, that allows everyone to express themselves. But we also, if anyone, has anyone here heard of Smiling Mind? Mindful of Sound, there's a few nods around the room. Fantastic app, made by an Australian, so it's good to hear someone talk to you with your own accent as opposed to an American accent. Um, and we run one of these at the end of each of our workshops, it's called Body Scan, where everyone finds a place to sit, it might be on the floor or a seat against the wall, uh, and they're walked through this uh, a series of exercises where they are brought back into the present. They're brought back into feeling their hands and their feet and their legs, and it puts people away from that mental task that they've been doing and back into the present, which is a really good way of um, bringing people back. And having food and handsy things on tables. This is something that's come up only in the last few ones that we've done. It might be uh, quite an obvious thing for the psychologists in the room, uh, but as designers, we weren't as aware. Um, having little bouncy balls, Play-Doh, like um, candy snakes, and all sorts of just like children's toys. Having someone do something with their hands, having a presenter today is fantastic. Um, it really allows people to, to take away from feeling in themselves and have something to do that distracts them while they talk. Really, really effective. And I was, while I wasn't aware of it beforehand, after I saw it in practice, it was just an incredible thing to see someone just bouncing a ball and suddenly they went from not talking to expressing themselves really, really well and we got some really great stuff out of them. And implementing that support scaffolding. This is a kind of term that I've coined, but um, it's about making sure that everybody is briefed, uh, everyone, you do a debrief afterwards, you uh, practice reflective learning, which is a really big one. Briefing, so I'll go through them quickly. So pre-briefing, obviously sitting down beforehand for an extended period of time, talking each other through what you're going to be going through, perhaps identifying with each other what might be a trigger for you. If it's, if it's you know, I, I had my nan die earlier this year and we were going into um, a workshop dealing with ageing. And so that was something that um, I identified with myself. I communicated that outwards to the people around me. And while it didn't come up as a thing, I felt a lot more secure as a facilitator to express myself and be a little bit more forward so that everyone else was able to do, do the same. Debriefing afterwards, we have an, uh, a practice that we call, oh God, what is it? Learned, opportunities, and want to know uh, as the three things, which allows us to talk about, we write them down on sticky notes, put them up on the wall. Any service designers in the room will probably um, nod their head to this one. But it's a really good one to be able to say, what have I learned out of this? What have we learned, not just from the participants, but what have we learned about ourselves and the way that we run our workshops? What are the opportunities we see for the uh, improvement over time of these workshops as well? And what do we want to know to make this uh, better in the future? After that uh, workshop where we had that sort of trigger waterfall, um, we said, well, what can we do? We implement um, more rigorous protocols. We implement a more rigorous and understanding um, chain of command if something does go wrong. And since that point, we've been able to conduct a lot more, not necessarily intense, but in-depth um, workshops with people who deal with poor mental health, and they've been a lot more effective. And reflective learning. This has also recently come onto the plate, and I try, didn't realise that I practised it myself, which is sitting down after a workshop, after an interview, after any dealing you've had with someone external, and saying, how did I go? Just reflect on the language that you've learned. Reflect on what you have learned about your tone, about your voice. All of those things go into making sure that as an individual, you're able to take that forward into the next workshop that you run. 
As I mentioned earlier, we've got the mental health first aid, really great qualification to get if you can. Um, it's a two day course and it uh, really brings attention to what you can do to uh, understand the, what might be triggers in others or behaviours that might be indicators of poor mental health, how to deal um, and triage in that first instance with people um, who might be affected. And imp uh, implementing an employee access program for anyone who might be a business owner here, pardon me, and have uh, employees. We've recently partnered with The Mind Room, which is a psychologist organisation just down on Wellington Street. Uh, and we now offer all staff um, psychological uh, appointments if they choose to on the house, which is really great for that idea of um, external debriefing. Sometimes you might be going through something that you don't really want to share with your colleagues because you're going to work with them the next day. Or maybe you've experienced something that you didn't want to share in a debrief. Now you can, you can go elsewhere and you can talk through those things uh, and be able to, to feel a lot better about it. And above all, you let your purpose drive you. Purpose being the core of what we do at Portable and what we seek out, it gives us strength. For me, this is the, probably the biggest thing because you, work, you walk into a workshop with a complex social issue like mental health, family violence, all of those different areas, and you're able to say, we are doing good. We're here to bring out the best in people and to find solutions to the problems that have affected them that a lot of people, a lot of other people aren't able to address. That's a really big part of it and it enables you to take those couple of extra steps. Particularly when you have that support scaffolding around you, you can take those extra couple of steps and you can go that little bit further and find better ways of providing solutions and bringing those out of the people that you work with. And that's me. Thank you.